Hello, I am Dr. Azal from MedicoVisual.com and in this lecture we will talk about the beta cell failure or beta cell exhaustion in type 2 diabetes mellitus. So normally as you know that beta cells they happily sec start secreting, they continue secreting some amount of insulin. But when there is insulin resistance of course these beta cell they have to ramp up the production and uh, release of insulin so they work day and night uh, to release so much insulin they overwork to compensate for the insulin resistance and as they overwork they get tired uh, because they have to work harder to compensate for insulin resistance. They have to release more insulin than uh, they were normally secreting. So they will become exhausted, they will become tired, they will become overworked. And as a result, ultimately beta cell destruction may occur. Now this beta cell destruction in type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is not immune mediated but it is due to beta cell exhaustion. Now what they say is that at the type 2 diabetes mellitus it is not usually solely caused by insulin resistance. Why? Because if there is just insulin resistance the beta cells they can continue to ramp up the production and release of insulin and they, they are somehow uh, successful to in compensating for the insulin resistance and as long as they are successful in compensating the insulin resistance the glucose level it will remain almost normal there won't be a significant hyperglycemia and thus diabetes does not occur solely due to insulin resistance but a time will come when insulin resistance is too much in the body and along with that some of the beta cells uh, rather I would I should say many of the beta cells they are destroyed due to overwork there is beta cell dysfunction there is beta cell exhaustion leading to beta cell destruction and when there is insulin resistance along with beta cell destruction then this may lead to type 2 diabetes mellitus so the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes mellitus it consists of insulin resistance followed by beta cell destruction but the question is that how exactly does beta cell failure occur and we will answer this question step by step so let's suppose here is a beta cell and uh, here is the nucleus of this beta cell and within the nucleus of course there would be DNA and here is the endoplasmic reticulum which is involved in protein synthesis the rough endoplasmic reticulum which has the ribosomes attached to it it is specifically involved in protein synthesis now this DNA it will have many different type of genes many different types of genes but here the important one that we uh, we will focus upon is the insulin gene so from insulin uh, the RNA is synthesized mRNA is synthesized so here you can see that mRNA is synthesized and it will go to the this rough endoplasmic reticulum and here from this mRNA by reading this mRNA a protein will be synthesized by a rough endoplasmic reticulum we will not go into details of protein synthesis right now so the protein from that is being synthesized from the mRNA of insulin it is not insulin initially it is pre-pro-insulin. What happens to this pre-pro-insulin? First, uh, the signaling part, this this one, let me show you. So first of all, this, this part, the signaling part, uh, it will be uh, removed. Uh, let me show you how. So this part will be removed and uh, this will then become pro-insulin then it will here is the Golgi apparatus this will 
the, this part of rough endoplasmic reticulum it will pinch off it will bud off and it will go to the Golgi apparatus and here this pro insulin it will then further cleaved it will be then further cleaved into insulin the mature insulin and again it will bud off from the Golgi apparatus and it will form the secretory vesicle which may then be secreted outside the cell and uh, you know it is not the only the insulin that is being secreted along with insulin we also have another protein called amylin this amylin it is also called islet amylide polypeptide iapp and how it is synthesized this amylin it is very similar to the uh, insulin that first there is pre pro amylin or pre pro iapp then there is formation of pro iapp and ultimately the amylin is formed now here you see that this is let's suppose a part of golgi apparatus and here is pro insulin and uh, it is converted by a cutter it is cleaved by a molecular cutter into insulin so this cutter let me show you how this cutter it will uh, wait here so this cutter it will remove this part and this part will become C peptide so it will remove this part and uh, after removal of this part here the insulin will be formed and uh, okay so insulin will be formed this way similar to that we have pro IAPP or pro amylin it is also cleaved by this same very cutter molecular cutter or enzyme into IAPP the mature amylin now the same enzyme is involved in cleavage of both of these prohormones and the name of this enzyme is prohormone convertase. It is not called proinsulin convertase. It is called prohormone convertase because it converts the both of the prohormones that is proinsulin and proamylin into the mature hormone, mature form of those hormones. Now when lots of insulin and lots of amylin is being synthesized and secreted outside due to excessive workload on the beta cells of pancreas, uh, obviously this enzyme will also be overworked and it won't be able to handle so much workload and if it is not able to uh, handle so much workload it starts secreting abnormally cleaved proteins it, it there is some problem some dysfunction with this enzymes and this leads to abnormal cleavage of these pro hormones abnormal cleavage of pro insulin and abnormal cleavage of pro iapp or pro amylin so as a result there will be abnormally cleaved misfolded proteins now the problem is that as these as there is accumulation of misfolded proteins in the Golgi apparatus and uh, within the uh, what is this endoplasmic reticulum, this endoplasmic reticulum it is a remarkable organelle. It can detect the presence of misfolded proteins and it will uh, it will alarm the cell. It will raise an alarm within the cell. It will raise an emergency that there is something wrong with the cell. So the cell, it will drastically decrease the rate of protein synthesis and it will try to first repair those misfolded proteins. So it will bring the protein, misfolded protein repair machinery and it will try to repair the cell, repair the proteins, misfolded proteins. And if this process fail to occur if misfolded proteins fail to be refolded properly then the cell will commit suicide and if there are lots of misfolded proteins due to overwork of beta cells then lots of cells will die lots of cells will commit suicide in this way the beta cell overwork may lead to beta cell dysfunction which may ultimately lead to beta cell failure due to beta cell destruction. This is one reason. The other reason is that endoplasmic reticulum it is not perfect. 
sometime uh, misfolded proteins they may slip through those uh, misfolded response system misfolded de proteins detection system so these misfolded proteins they may uh, seep out of they may be secreted out of the cell now the property of a misfolded protein especially the misfolded amylin protein their property is that they have some hydrophobic regions let's say here and here so they have some hydrophobic region and these high hydrophobic regions they may interact with each other let's say here is a hydrophobic region and here is a hydrophobic region so they may uh, interact with each other so those exposed hydrophobic region as they interact with each other what will happen what will be the result the result will be that they may aggregate they may clump together and as they clump together long fibrils may form long fibrils of proteins okay let me show you so here uh, this type of long protein fibrils may form and what we call them they are called amyloid deposits so amyloid deposits may form within outside the uh, this beta cells within the islet of pancreas so misfolded protein they aggregate together to form amyloid amyloid deposits and that is why this amyloid protein is called islet amyloid a uh, polypeptide because it is associated with amyloid deposited initially when uh, this this uh, this protein this hormone was discovered they found that it is present within these amyloid deposits within the amyloid deposits some normal amyloid proteins were also found uh, also found so they named it that it is somehow associated with amyloid amyloid deposits so they call it IAPP but later on they found that it has some important normal functions as well amylin has some important physiological functions as well but we will not go into that details in this lecture we might do some um, separate lecture on this topic right now what they say is that these amyloid deposits they may physically start damaging the beta cells but this theory is not proven so their role in uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus pathogenesis is still controversial so this endoplasmic stress due to lots of protein synthesis due to excessive protein synthesis which leads to uh, abnormal protein misfolded protein uh, synthesis and which leads to apoptosis of cells this is one hypothesis of beta cell destruction in type 2 diabetes mellitus but this is not the only theory this is not the only reason for beta cell destruction in type 2 diabetes mellitus let's discuss some more reasons so let's uh, suppose that here is a cell and specifically now we are talking about beta cell of pancreas and uh, here is glucose uh, now this is the revision from previous lecture it enters uh, in the cell through the glut channels glut transporters and it is converted by the process of glycolysis to pyruvate now as the pyruvate is synthesized we get the energy in the form of energy currency the atp but we do not only get energy currency the coins now we also get some bank checks what are bank checks fadh2 and nadh specifically in glycolysis mainly nadh is formed now this nadh uh, it goes to mitochondria a bank inside mitochondria and from this bank uh, these uh, nadh as it comes to it comes here now as the nadh this check comes here to complex 1 uh, then from complex 1 it goes to the complex 3 uh, and then from complex 3 to complex 4 and ultimately this complex 5 uh, this will after processing this check by these components of this bank these bank officers the this boss officer complex 5 it will ultimately give you the currency so this is like withdrawing a check so you give a check to these bank officers and ultimately you get your currency in the form of coins so let me show you how it happens so if uh, so yeah 
so ultimately as this check is withdrawn you get your uh, energy currency that is atp from this complex 5 so that's how this check is withdrawn uh, and from the spirovate it will enter into this uh, mitochondria and it will ultimately be converted into acetyl co and it will it will run through tcs cycle and through TCA cycle again the energy currency ATP is formed and along with that NADH and FADH2 which are the checks those checks are formed and again these checks will go to these complexes of proteins basically they are called electron transport chain which I am calling as bank uh, for the sake of analogy and again from the free fatty acids through the process of beta oxidation acetyl co is formed and these checks are formed and these checks again they can be withdrawn through the electron transport chain now if more checks are formed more nadh and fadh2 are formed it means this electron transport chain it has to overwork right now uh, there is some problem with this overworking of electron transport chain we will see how that if it, if this electron transport chain overworks it generates some toxic uh, reactive oxygen species which are damaging to cell we will see in a minute but before that let me tell you something about the beta oxidation the brief idea that how it occurs uh, so let's say there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 12 carbon uh, 12 hydrocarbon containing uh, uh, what is this fatty acid now this fatty acid as it is processed in series as a, uh, during the process of beta oxidation it is clear off uh, in series that two hydrocarbons are removed so how it happens first uh, through these hydrocarbons NADH is formed one FADH is uh, one FADH2 is formed and ultimately it is cleaved off as acetyl CoA molecule this process then continues other two hydrocarbons again one and NADH one FADH2 and one acetyl CoA and it continues ultimately we reach to the last two hydrocarbons and from these hydrocarbons we cannot get NADH and FADH2 because it itself is acetyl CoA and it's this acetyl CoA where it will go it will go to this TCA cycle so this is the basic idea of uh, beta oxidation so the thing that I want to put in your mind through this diagram is that generally the hydrocarbons the fatty acids chain they contain lots of hydrocarbon a typical free fatty acid called palmitic acid it consists of 16 carbon atoms it means it it is it consists of 16 hydrocarbons it is a chain of 16 hydrocarbons connected together they are connected in series so from this 16 hydrocarbon chain uh, compound palmitic acid seven uh, molecules of nadh and seven molecule of fadh2 are formed but compare this with uh, glucose very few molecules of i think four molecules of nadh are only formed as a result of glycolysis but through fatty acid beta oxidation lot more lot more of these checks are formed lot more of NADH and FADH2 are formed so it means that uh, the as a result of beta oxidation because more checks are formed so it means this electron transport chain it will run faster uh, if, if beta oxidation ramps up if beta oxidation is going on faster it means electron transport chain will run faster even with glycolysis also electron transport chain will run faster but it will run much faster if beta oxidation is going on and this faster running of this electron transport chain is risky let me tell you how so here is this uh, these uh, electron transport chain it actually consists of some complex of protein protein 1 2 and coenzyme q protein 3 4 and 5 
uh, let's briefly talk about them we will not go into details but here uh, uh, to the protein one the complex one NADH it donates its proton and electrons to it and it becomes NAD positive and FADH2 it gives the electrons to this complex two now from this complex one the electron will go to coenzyme Q and from coenzyme Q it will go to complex 3 and from 3 to complex 4. Similarly from protein 2 complex 2 it will go to coenzyme Q and from coenzyme Q electrons will go to complex 3 and from 3 to 4. In this way the electrons are ferried ultimately to the complex 4 and this ferring of uh, electrons it leads to release of lots of energy and this energy that are released as a result of uh, this moment of electrons it is uh, used to push the protons from matrix to the this intermembranous space this is a, the space between inner mitochondrial membrane this is the inner mitochondrial membrane and this is the outer mitochondrial membrane in between them is the space called intermembranous space now these protons they are pushed against the concentration gradient into this intermembranous space how they are pushed they are pushed uh, into this space because we are getting by using the energy that we are getting from these electrons now you must have noticed that i have not shown the protons being pushed through complex 2 because no electrons are pushed through this complex 2 the reason is that when FADH2 they transmit proton, uh, electrons to this, uh, this complex 2 no energy is released however um, FADH2 it can still ultimately there is still release of net energy as these electrons they are transported to co uh, coenzyme Q and ultimately from coenzyme Q to complex 3 and 4 now as a result of this lots of proton they will accumulate into this intermembranous space and now they have no way to come inside the cell except a single hole this single hole is inside this complex 5 so the only way these protons can come in is through this hole within the complex 5 so through the complex 5 according to concentration gradient according to the electrochemical gradient the protons enter within the mitochondrial matrix and as it happens energy is released and this energy which is released through this movement of protons according to their electrochemical gradient it is used to physically rotate this motor this uh, molecular motor called complex 5 so this motor will rotate and as it rotates again it will release some energy and that energy it is used to convert ADP into ATP so what we have what we had given to this electron transport chain we had given these NADH and FADH2 and what we have got as a result we have got ATP the energy currency that's how the whole this system this electron transport chain works now we will dive a bit deeper into chemistry i know many of you hate chemistry but i will try to make it as simple as possible for you because without understanding the chemistry you will not know that you will not understand that what i am saying so here is oxygen and the outer shell of this oxygen it consists of one two three four five and six so six electrons are there in the outer shell of oxygen generally the um, generally saying the atoms they need eight electrons in their outer shell to become stable but how many electron it has in its outer shell it has six so it is short of two electrons to live a stable life again there is another oxygen which is very similar to this again another oxygen atom which is almost identical to this and again it is also having six electron in its outermost shell and it also needs two electrons to live a happy and stable life now these two electron uh, two, two oxygen atoms they will talk to each other 
and they say okay this uh, let's say this oxygen it will say to this oxygen atom that hey fellow oxy you also need two electrons in your outermost shell to live a happy life and i also need two electrons let's share our two electrons and we will form a bond we will live together and we will live happy happy life stable life so as they come close together and they share their outermost shells now you see how many electrons this this oxygen atom has 1 2 3 4 5 5 and two of this other atom as well so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 6 7 6, 7 6, 7, 6, 7, 6, 7, and 8 and how many electrons this oxygen atom has 1 2 3 4 5 this one is also included 6 7 and this this electron of other oxygen is also included so as a result of this they form this o2 the oxygen molecule and that is why oxygen is generally present in environment as the molecular form this o2 form because it is a stable form so as i have told you that this o2 this oxygen it is richly dissolved in the matrix of the mitochondria now as these electrons they are ferried they are transported through this electron transport chain some of these electrons they accidentally leak into the uh, this matrix this mitochondrial matrix and this greedy oxygen it this greedy o2 molecule it accepts this this electron it will say okay let's pick up this another electron although it was stable but still it picks up an electron and it becomes super oxide it becomes highly reactive substance that is called super oxide now the super oxide because it is having that extra electron it tries to show up this electron in in everyone's as well not everyone's as it try to show up this electron into everyone's outer shell it try to react with every component of uh, of your of your cell so it it may react with some uh, let's say protein or even some lipid uh, some membrane lipid so some membrane lipid let's say may be there and this o2 superoxide it may react with this protein uh, this lipid and it will lead to a chain reaction so let's say it gives off uh, let's say it gives off this electron to this lipid then this lipid it it will also become supercharged with this uh, with this electron and it will try to give this uh, give this extra electron to some other lipid and that will try to give it give it to some other lipid and in this way a chain reaction will start ultimately uh, this will only stop when it react with some antioxidant substance this process is called lipid peroxidation and it damages many components of the cell it can damage the the many proteins many lipids the membranes of the cell and as a result of these reactive oxygen species uh, not only this superoxide is not the only reactive oxygen species species there are certain others as well for example h2o2 uh, yeah h2o2 and uh, some other one that we will not talk into detail uh, the thing is that these reactive oxygen species they can react with different components of the cell and they can damage the cell this problem is generally mitigated by some antioxidants present inside the cell but thankfully these reactive oxygen species as a result of uh, this electron transport chain they are not very oftenly formed why they are not very oftenly formed let's talk about that so basically they are taken care of by this complex 4 generally these reactive oxygen species they are formed due to incomplete reduction incomplete reduction of this uh, oxygen molecule but this complex 4 it doesn't allow the incomplete reduction of oxygen it only leaves the oxygen when there is complete reduction of oxygen and there is formation of water how come let's see so here is this oxygen molecule 
this complex 4 it will first tightly grab this oxygen molecule it will not allow it to leave this thing prematurely so what it will say to this oxygen molecule it will say to this oxygen that hey dear oxys why are you having this homosexual relationship with each other by the way no offense to homosexuals watching this video it is just that this complex four is um, a bit of orthodox no it's not homophobic it is just orthodox so it says to this oxygen that hey dear oxys stop being in this homosexual relationship and get heterosexual with hydrogen <laughs> let let's see how so it says that first grab these two electrons so it give these each of these oxygen two electrons and as they get these two electrons they become stable all alone and they leave each other because they have eight electrons in this in their outer shells but as they have got these uh, these uh, electrons these extra electrons in this outer shell and electrons you know they are what charge they are negatively charged so they have got a negative charge on them okay let's see how so they have got these two uh, so they have got these two negative charges now due to these negative charges some positive substances will attract and bind with them what are those positive substances the positive substances were the protons so these protons h positive ions they will bind with this and now they are completely reduced and water has been formed and now this complex four will leave this water of course we do not have charge on them now now it's neutral water is formed so as water is formed the oxygen is completely reduced and now this complex four it will leave the water as is and now there is almost no risk of formation of reactive oxygen species now try to understand this thing if only one electron is shoved into this oxygen then superoxide is formed but if two electrons are given to it and along with two, two electrons they bind with two protons then water is formed and this is complete reduction of oxygen and this complete reduction it does not lead to formation of superoxide so normally this uh, this uh, this oxygen it is being taken care of by these complex by this complex 4 and there is very rare formation of superoxides and other reactive oxygen species within the mitochondria through the process of electron transport chain this is the normal thing but when we have uh, when this electron transport chain it is running very very fast it is running quickly and swiftly there is chance of leaking of more electrons there is chance of le leaking of more and more electrons into the mitochondrial matrix normally because it is running at a slow pace so less electrons leak into this mitochondrial matrix and there is less formation of reactive oxygen species but as it runs faster more electrons leak into matrix and more formation of more is the formation of reactive oxygen species and normally these reactive oxygen species they are taken care of they are neutral by antioxidants like superoxide dismutase but when lots of these reactive oxygen species are formed even these uh, these antioxidants are also overwhelmed and as a result of this these reactive oxygen species they are formed in excess and these excessive reactive oxygen species they destroy the cell and as the vital components of the cell they are destroyed it leads to suicide of the cell it leads to apoptosis by the beta cell of pancreas and this process it is not a specific for beta cell it can happen in any cell reactive oxygen species mediated damage can can happen in any cell of the body now the question is that if someone asks you that uh, which of these can generate more reactive oxygen species glucose or uh, lipids 
your answer should be lipids because lipids they generate lots of uh, NADH and FADH2 as compared to glucose which generate less NADH and FADH2 and if there is more formation of these NADH and FADH2 more will be the speed of electron transport chain and more should more would be the leakiness of these electrons which lead to generation of extra reactive oxygen species which may overwhelm the antioxidant system for example glutathione uh, peroxidase superoxide dismutase and uh, peroxidase and many other many other components let's not go into those details now this was about how beta cell destruction occur due to uh, the ER stress and due to reactive oxygen species. Along with that there is generalized a, a concept of lipotoxicity that is toxicity due to lipid compounds. Lipids can be directly toxic to beta cells and any other cell as well. How can, uh, how, what is the mechanism of lipotoxicity? One, you have already seen that there is generation of reactive oxygen species. The other is that along with that there is lipids, they can directly stimulate protein kinase pathway and we have already seen it that um, the free fatty acid, diacylglycerol and ceramides, they may activate protein kinase C uh, which then activate uh, the which can deactivate the IRS and which can also uh, cause dysfunction of many different cellular pathways it may activate or inactivate many other cellular pathways as well which we do not want it may apparently activate abnormally activate different pathways or inactivate different cellular pathways and in this way lipids can be toxic for the cell for beta cell or any other cell. The third mechanism is that these uh, lipids, let me tell you how. So here is a protein and here uh, let's say a hydrophobic part of this protein and here is another hydrophobic part. So these are the hydrophobic part of these of this protein. Now they are closely opposed with each other and because of their close opposition they are forming a particular structure. Why they are closely opposed together because of hydrophobic interaction. Now you know lipids they are non-polar substances and sometimes they are more more hydrophobic than these amino acid residues. So they may come between them and they may disrupt the structure of uh, the proteins this is just like uh, this was let's say you and this was your girlfriend and here someone more handsome and uh, more beautiful person than you it came between you and um, it has stolen your girlfriend <laughs> that's how this lipid they come in between this couple of hydrophobic components of protein and in this way it may disrupt the structure of protein so this was the third mechanism of lipotoxicity. The fourth one is that this lipid droplet as it becomes large, many cell they start accumulating lipids for uh, the later use for energy. They start storing these lipids. But as excessive lipids they start accumulating in the cell, they may start physically damaging the cell. It is especially common in hepatocyte that that is what we call fatty liver hepatotoxicity due to lipids uh, but it may occur in any cell even in the beta cells of pancreas. So these were the mechanism through which excessive lipids in overnutrition due to overnutrition we have excessive lipids in our body and these excessive lipids they directly damage the cell uh, including beta cells of pancreas and due to this thing beta cell, uh, beta cell dysfunction leading to beta cell destruction may occur. Even the glucose is also toxic. You know, excess of everything is bad. Even these sweet candies, these sweet glucose, they are also toxic in excessive, in excess. How come? Because again, due to reactive oxygen species generation that we have already discussed with lipids, they also ramp up the production of NADH, which, um, which overdrives the um, electron transport chain, which leads to excessive ROS formation. Along with that, uh, the glucose, it, it may generate some products 
and these substances they may glycate they may combine with these proteins and uh, they may glycate these proteins and this glycation of proteins it leads to the abnormal dysfunction rather i would say it it may lead to dysfunction of these proteins even it may uh, change the structure of this these proteins so this is called formation of and advanced glyco glycation end products so advanced glycation end products are formed and due to this reason the proteins are dysfunctional so dysfunction of protein in any cell if if vital proteins are dysfunctional in a cell it may damage the cell it may lead to uh, cell committing suicide the apoptosis so that were few mechanism through which the beta cell exhaustion and beta cell destruction occurs in type 2 diabetes mellitus thank you so much for watching this video